Hola, ¿qué pasa, hermosos bastardos? Me llamo Philip DeFranco y tengo un show loco para ti. I, uh, I downloaded Duolingo and did that for like two hours, and I'm pretty sure I just mastered a language. I didn't. Also, I did realize that I have to, I can't use my American voice to say Spanish. Hola, ¿qué pasa, hermosos bastardos? <laughs> This is just for fun. Do not expect a uh, Philip DeFranco show in Espanol. But I really do have a good show for you, so buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. And to start today off, let's talk about this Florence Pugh body shaming controversy that you might have seen. Right, so she is an actress. She's in Rome. She wears a pink Valentino dress for a fashion event. Though I can't show you the photo here on YouTube because they're fascists. They're not. They're not fascists. I also, we shouldn't overuse that word since they're actual fascists trying to take over the country right now. What I mean is I can't show it because the top of her dress is sheer. You can see her chest, including her nipples through it, which of course, as science has shown us, very dangerous. As we know, if you look directly at too many nipples during the course of your life, your brain explodes. A bad day for you and an unfortunate mess for someone else to clean up. It's rude. But for Florence, not long after she posts the photo of her wearing the dress on Instagram, she follows it up with a second post addressing all the comments that she received for it. Saying that when she wore it, she obviously knew that it would drum up some reactions, but adding, what's been interesting to watch and witness is just how easy it is for men to totally destroy a woman's body publicly, proudly for everyone to see. It isn't the first time and certainly won't be the last time a woman will hear what's wrong with her body by a crowd of strangers. What's worrying is just how vulgar some of you men can be. And adding, she's come to terms with all the elements of her body, even the parts that she used to have trouble accepting. But noting that so many people were aggressively letting her know that she has a small chest or that she should be embarrassed by being so flat chested. But Pew saying there, I've lived in my body for a long time. I'm fully aware of my breast size and I'm not scared of it. What's more concerning is why are you so scared of breasts? Small, large, left, right, only one, maybe none. What is so terrifying? And adding that it just makes her wonder what happened to all these people that they feel so comfortable saying these things online. And arguing grow up, respect people, respect bodies, respect all women, respect humans. Life will get a whole lot easier, I promise. Promise. And personally, here's what I'll say with this story. I do not doubt that Florence Pugh received some hate or just like horrible comments after posting this photo. She is a woman on the internet. That, it doesn't excuse it, but it's expected. But the positive is as far as all the top reactions and comments to this, they're all positive. You really have to search and scroll to find those comments, but also as someone that puts content out, it's very easy to just kind of hone in on those. And personally, I found myself agreeing with comments like, funny how a culture who is obsessed with porn can find anything offensive. And so men can wank over porn and objectify women, no worries. But when a woman takes control over her body, sexuality, and beauty, it's shameful. And here's the thing, that is kind of an all-encompassing statement. You know, you can't you can't talk about all men. But yeah, I do believe that many men who watch porn, they they pay for OnlyFans, right? They're, they're turning Belle Delphine and Amaranth and all these other people into multi-multi-millionaires. Which, in a quickie side story news, both of those creators have recently revealed how much they They've made from OnlyFans alone since joining the platform, and holy shit, it's in excess of $30 million each. And yeah, some of these guys, despite feeding this massive, massive industry, will also then go on to just slut shame random women. And at that point, it becomes very obvious that this is really more of just like a power dynamic thing. Right, at that point, I think it just becomes a question of like, were you raised and brainwashed to think a certain way, or is this really just you kind of exposing yourself as being a, a tiny, empty little person? But yeah, also, I, I just don't think that nipples are a big thing. For a woman, you know, I understand society has historically like sexualized them, but they, you know, they feed babies is there. They're sexual in the same way that, that kissing a neck can be sexual. I think it's uh, fucking insane if you try to equate uh, female nipples with like straight up shots of genitals. But uh, I also understand that not everyone kind of sees the world like me. I just think that it's a part of society that's kind of stupid. But hey, whether you agree or disagree with me, let me know your thoughts in those comments down below. And then Elon Musk had quite the weekend. Friday night, he backed out of the deal to buy Twitter, which has a breakup fee of $1 billion. So how much is this actually going to cost? We don't know because not long after Twitter announced that it would be taking Elon to court to force him to buy the company. You know, well, Many people have seen and talk about this situation as kind of a left-wing versus right-wing situation with Elon Musk getting more and more political over the past few months. Out of nowhere over the weekend, you had Donald Trump coming in from the top rope. He's got himself a mess. You know, he said the other day, oh, I've never voted for a Republican. I said, I didn't know that. He told me he voted for me. So he's another bullshit artist. But as far as why Musk is backing out, he claims that the company had breached their sale agreement and was not providing information about spam accounts. With Musk, as he does, posting a meme about this on Twitter, using photos of himself laughing about the fact that by trying to force the merger in court, Twitter would also be forced to disclose bot info. But for their part, Twitter has claimed that they're sharing that information with Musk per their agreement. This news also notably seeing Twitter's share prices drop after closing on Friday, with that downward trend continuing this morning when Twitter fell roughly 6%, bringing it to a two-month low and notably to a 36% decline from what Musk agreed to purchase the company at in April. Tesla stock also has a recording list taking about a 4% dive today. And as far as what actually happens from here, it appears that there are a number of paths. The places like CNBC noting, hey, one option is that the deal just ends, it's clean, there's no litigation, and Musk just has to pay a billion dollar termination fee. There's also the case that this goes to court, Twitter wins, meaning that Musk could be forced to either buy the company or just pay damages. Or Musk could win in court and walk away with fully clean hands and not have to pay the termination fee. Or we might see something like a settlement or maybe a new negotiation for Musk to buy Twitter at a different price. But yeah, ultimately for now, we're gonna have to 
to wait to see what happens. And I mean that in a few ways. One, from a legal standpoint, you know, what actually happens with Twitter and Elon going to court, as well as what is the public reaction and fallout to Donald Trump saying this? Because a lot of people who see Trump as like their God King have looked at Elon Musk as like, this is the guy, he's actually on our side. He's gonna bring Trump back. They're boys, but now Trump's shitting on Elon. I'd love to know your thoughts, but no matter what, it's gonna be interesting. Because that seems primed for someone, I don't know who, to have a very bad time. But from that, I wanna take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Raycon. Raycon's wireless earbuds give you amazing audio quality wherever you go for half the price without compromise. And they have three sound profiles, pure sound for when I'm listening to podcasts, balanced sound for when the music changes up, and I love the bass sound, great for R&B when I'm winding down or riding my bike. And Raycons are so comfortable with optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit, so they won't budge, and trust me, they will not budge. Plus, Raycon earbuds have a 32-hour battery life for eight hours of playtime with a built-in mic, so I can take calls with two taps of a button. They're also set to noise isolation, but if you need to hear what's going on around you, just touch and hold the right earbud logo for three seconds and you're in awareness mode. And did I mention that they are Siri and Alexa compatible and super easy to pair? It's really no wonder why Raycon's everyday earbuds have over 50,000 five-star reviews. So what are you waiting for? Just click that link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash DeFranco and get 15% off your Raycon purchase. And then, do y'all remember when we were kids and they taught us cheaters never prosper and then we like lived our lives and we were like, wait a second, the opposite of what you said is true. Almost exclusively the worst people in society succeed. But I'm mentioning this today because the Uber news that just came out just further confirms it. More than 120,000 documents were leaked to The Guardian and they detail the legally questionable, morally bankrupt methods that they used to become a global ride-sharing empire. The confidential documents dubbed the Uber files spanning a five-year period from 2013 to 2017 when the company was run by its co-founder, Travis Kalanick, whom the board successfully pressured to step down back in 2017 following a number of scandals, including revelations of a culture of sexual harassment in the workplace. And now, after all the previous articles, the books, they have a fucking series about how ridiculous the rise of Uber was, we have now gotten a further glimpse into how the leadership skirted around laws and regulations to pry open international markets and crush competing taxi services. But first, we should definitely talk about the lobbying, because the files show Uber discreetly courting prime ministers, presidents, billionaires, oligarchs, and media barons from around the world, spending tens of millions of dollars on lobbyists and organizing face-to-face meetings between its executives and then U.S. Vice President Joe Biden, then French Economy Minister Emmanuel Macron, and more. And with these, at least six meetings with British Tory cabinet ministers were undeclared, which falls in kind of this legal gray area. Also with Macron, he personally texted Kalanick and secretly helped the company by brokering a deal with his opponents in the cabinet. We also know that Uber artificially lowered its prices to drive competitors into the ground in foreign cities before raising them again, doing that by providing subsidies to drivers in some places paying as much as 90% of their hourly earnings, which basically rendered its service free, which we saw in response to this protest erupting from taxi drivers in Paris back in 2016. We've now learned in response, Kalanick ordered executives to encourage Uber drivers to stage a counter protest. And when his team warned him that extreme right thugs might attack their drivers, Kalanick persisted saying, I think it's worth it. Violence guarantees success. And one former senior executive telling The Guardian that was part of a strategy of weaponizing drivers and exploiting violence to keep the controversy burning, with that seemingly repeated across Europe in countries like Belgium, Spain, Italy, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. We also saw the company taking advantage of one particular incident in which masked men turned on Uber drivers with knuckle dusters and a hammer in Amsterdam, with Uber trying to use that to earn concessions from the Dutch government. You've also got the files revealing how Uber played a game of legal cat and mouse with the authorities, because in the documented words of one of the senior executives who wrote an email, we are not legal in many countries. We should avoid making antagonistic statements. And another commenting, we have officially become pirates. And the head of global communications adding, sometimes we have problems because, well, we're just fucking illegal. And so you had authorities in many countries clamping down on Uber and pounding unlicensed drivers, cars, and even raiding company offices. But it's been revealed that Uber devised tactics to evade the police, one of which was dubbed the kill switch. Where when an office in one country was raided, executives would frantically cut off that office from main data systems to prevent law enforcement from accessing evidence. With that move being made at least a dozen times in France, the Netherlands, Belgium, India, Hungary, and Romania. Now, with all that, as far as responses, you had a spokesperson for Kalanick saying that he never authorized any actions or programs that would obstruct justice in any country, and adding that he never suggested that Uber should take advantage of violence at the expense of driver safety, saying the reality was that Uber's expansion initiatives were led by over a hundred leaders in dozens of countries around the world, and at all times under the direct oversight and with the full approval of Uber's robust legal policy and compliance groups. Also going on to question the file's authenticity and pointing out that many of the reporters behind the investigation probably use Uber themselves. But as far as Uber's official statement, they seemed more like, uh, well, everyone kind of knows Uber is a fucked up situation, but we're a new Uber now. With Uber's senior vice president of public affairs responding, with there has been no shortage of reporting on Uber's mistakes prior to 2017. Five years ago, those mistakes culminated in one of the most infamous reckonings in the history of corporate America. That reckoning led to an enormous amount of public scrutiny, a number of high profile lawsuits, multiple government investigations, and the terminations of several senior executives. It's also exactly why Uber hired a new CEO who is tasked with transforming every aspect of how Uber operates. And noting that the CEO was guided from the start by the recommendations of Eric Holder, a former U.S. Attorney General hired by the company to investigate and overhaul our business practices.
practices. When we say Uber is a different company today, we mean it literally. 90% of current Uber employees joined after Dara became CEO. Or so essentially they're saying, hey, yeah, it's still the same ship, but over the last five years, we've replaced piece by piece of the ship where 90% of it's now new. So is it really the same ship? Yes and no. But ultimately that's where the story ends for now, though more details could emerge. But let's be honest, nothing's gonna happen because they lied to us as children. Cheaters never prosper, dot, 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 if it's a small cheat. The bigger the cheat gets, the more money that's involved, the more likely that person is to prosper. Bernie Madoff types are the exception, not the rule. Right? We live in a country where the people who made the opioid crisis will never spend a day in jail. They just gotta give people and government some of that sweet, sweet blood money. But you know this, you see this, you've got eyes and ears. And then let's talk about Texas power and weather. Cause right now it looks like some Texans are gonna be sweating buckets in the dark this week. Right? Just today, the heat index there was forecast to surpass 100 degrees Fahrenheit, even 110 in some places, which threatens to strain the power grid and potentially cause rolling blackouts, leading the state's electricity regulator to instruct businesses and residents to reduce their power usage, and saying you should turn up the thermostat at least one degree and not use major appliances from 2 to 8 p.m. Central Time on Monday, and adding that they expect demand for electricity in Texas to exceed capacity Monday afternoon. One of the really notable things here is that last week, they easily surpassed the projected peak for this season, and that wasn't supposed to happen for another month. And so regulators are warning that if demand spikes more than forecast, then power reserves could run dangerously low with no market solution. Or because telling people to reduce usage is just the first precaution to prevent blackouts. But if the power supply drops lower, more could come. Things including the regulator tapping other power grids nearby. And if that's not enough, they could order transmission companies to cut off electricity to industrial customers and residential consumers. And all this caused by a massive heat wave that began last week. It's put about 50 million people under heat warnings or advisories over the weekend. And this is happening while Texas's wind turbines in particular are struggling to generate power. The regulator is projecting that it will only hit less than 10% capacity on Monday, which is normal for daytime and the summer, especially ones this hot though more wind power is expected to become available on Tuesday. Now, of course, with this, you have Democrats skewering Governor Greg Abbott for not fixing the state's power grid after a devastating winter storm last year. Or you probably remember millions of people were left in the freezing cold without power, leading to hundreds of reported deaths. And so with this, you've got Beto O'Rourke, who's running for the governorship, saying, after that crisis, Abbott took millions in campaign checks from energy CEOs that he allowed to profit off it. Helps explain why he won't fix the grid. And adding, the governor of the ninth largest economy on earth, the energy capital of the world, can't guarantee the power will stay on tomorrow. We need change. And no matter what side you're on here, who you agree with, this is scary. Right? Understand, there will be suffering and potentially deaths from this blackout. And that's just this one. What about future infrastructure failures? Literally hundreds of Americans die from heat exhaustion every year. Not having power for air conditioning, fans, or refrigeration literally kills. And that's why you have so many who are warning that what's happening in Texas, this could just be a small taste of a summer of exhausted power grids around the world as global fuel supplies run low and climate change turns up the heat. And so that's why with this story, of course, I'd love to know everyone's thoughts, but especially right now, if you're in Texas, Arizona, Alabama, or any place that is feeling feeling the heat right now. How are you doing? What are your thoughts right now? And what are your thoughts about the future? But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. Thank you for watching. If you want more news, I got you covered right here. But my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.